Now, along the way, while you're dazzling people with these kinds of images, there's plenty of opportunity to get some real science in there. So when I write about feathered dinosaurs, for example, I, I don't hesitate to write about evolution. It fits right in. And you know, here's, a, here's a phylogeny showing the, uh, the evolution uh, of, of feathers and what we know about it now. And you, can, you, you could use the same kind of tree to talk about the evolution of SIV into HIV, which, which I have done. And believe it or not, people will follow you. They, they are interested in this stuff. These kinds of articles, like uh, the one I did, uh, I did a couple of, for the New York Times about this research, um, they were among the most emailed in all of the times for, for that particular week. So, so how did I go from macrobiology, that, that dinosaur, to microbiology, that little E. coli in the corner? Um, I guess for me, uh, parasites were sort of the gateway drug. <laughs> If you think about it, I mean, a lot of parasites are microbes. Um, and the ones that aren't microbes, they're still, for the most part, invisible to us. And, and when they're not invisible, they're pretty gross. Uh, and you could say that for a lot, a lot about microbes. Um, but uh, you know, nevertheless, gross or not, parasites have some unbelievable stories that you can tell about them. So as a writer, basically what I needed to do was to find those stories and tell them. Uh, it, it turns out that these stories are all over the place. I mean, you, you just um, need to sort of walk blindly into a parasitology textbook and they just hit you. Just to give you one example, this is called Saculina, uh, that yellow, little yellow patch at the bottom of the, uh, of the crab. Actually, in a sense, the whole crab is Saculina, um, but I'll explain that. So Saculina is a parasitic barnacle. And as a larva, it swims around and it finds a crab and it grabs on. And what it does is it actually inserts a few of its cells. It sort of becomes a microbe, if you can dig that. Uh, and that little slug of cells crawls through the crab until it gets to the, uh, where the crab's own um, larvae would be reared, its own pouch. And then it sets up shop. This is just half of... <laughs> Saculina, it, it sends out all these roots through its body. It castrates the crab. It basically controls its mind. It, it, uh, the crab treats it like its own uh, brood. It'll keep it clean, keep algae off of it. I mean, that is very cool. So, uh, so I wrote this book, uh, Parasite Rex, about it. And I, I, I was very pleased to see that it really did persuade a lot of other people that these things are cool as well. I mean. I have to say that when I was working on the book, and I actually went on a blind date where someone said, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm working on a book about parasites and how wonderful they are. And the date was, yeah, it was basically over soon after that. <laughs> but I had the last laugh, you see? Because a lot of other people recognize that parasites are incredibly cool as well. So I can't tell you, I wrote the, that book came out like 10 years ago, and people are still calling me up and saying, can we get you on the radio to talk about parasites? Because we just read the book. Sure, I'll say. So, so parasites have uh, infected Radio Lab. They've infected Coast to Coast, which is a crazy all-night radio show. Uh, this American Life had me on. I, I had the delight of um, talking to Ira Glass, and at one point he stopped, and he said, Mr. Zimmer, whose side are you on? So, and uh, th this is particularly nice, is that, um, is that novelists have, have read the book and they have been inspired. So there have been science fiction and fantasy novels that people have written after having read about the real biology that I wrote about. So just bear this in mind that, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you write about and it actually when, captivates people's imagination. When they can understand what it is you're doing, it, it is really compelling. I mean, I'm just so glad that, you know, I don't write about inorganic chemistry. <laughs> and no offense to the inorganic chemists. I mean, I, so, so that was getting me into, um, into microbiology. And in, in a sense, for me, uh, it wasn't even 
it wasn't even really science per se that really sort of got me in deep. Um, I, I kind of got interested in sort of the philosophy of biology. So, you know, what does it mean to be alive? And, and people have been asking this obviously for a long time. And, you know, Erwin Schrodinger very famously talked about it in his book, What is Life? But of course, if you actually like poke around and figure out the history of that book, um, you find out that he was just um, lifting stuff off of Max Delbruck. And what was Max Delbruck working on? Well, he was working on E. coli. And then you start to look into E. coli and you find E. coli everywhere. Um, I mean, I got more and more interested in E. coli as a way of talking about these big issues. I mean, it would be insane to try to write a book about the meaning of life, uh, but you can write a book about E. coli and hit some of these same themes. Um, so to tell that story about life, you can tell the story of E. coli. So I kind of had some of the same problems in talking to people about this new book I was working on that I had had before about parasites. So what are you working on now? Oh, I'm writing a book about E. coli. Oh, great. So like hamburgers and spinach and stuff, right? Uh, and, you know, it would sort of go downhill from there. Um, but, you know, I, e even though people might not have very pretty associations when someone says the word E. coli to them, um, I was determined, again, to try to show that beauty that's there with E. coli. Um, so, for example, when someone like David Goodsell makes an illustration like this, I mean, I think that shows that E. coli is as beautiful as, as a bat or a feathered dinosaur. Uh, the uh, organization uh, of the genome is, is uh, just as beautiful, and this is something that people like Delbruck couldn't really appreciate. And of course, uh, last night we heard Dr. Shapiro talking about um, the, the three-dimensional order of the genome. Um, and actually, I was pleased to see that she actually used the term beautiful to describe it. Uh, so so that, that's how I ended up writing um, the book E. coli. Um, but you know, the, the kind of strategy I had in writing this story of E. coli didn't just work in a book. It also works in newspapers. So, for example, while I was working on, on the book, there was a, uh, going to be a special package on evolution in the New York Times, and I said, you know, there's all this great stuff about evolution, experimental evolution with microbes. It was sort of a three-second pitch to my editor. We were done. He said, yes, go, write it. Uh, and it was, again, a very uh, popular article. I don't have to like, get too much in the details about it for an audience like this, but one of the things I talked about was Richard Lenski's work, um, where he has basically been rearing E. coli for 50,000 generations and has been tracking the revolution. And here you have this classic uh, graph that just shows you that, yes, in fact, evolution happens. Um, so um, I, I should also point out that um, while I had the same kind of um, grimaces from friends when I said I was working on a book about E. coli, um, after the book came out, they've also had a lot of the same uh, positive reactions. So I have been back on the radio to talk about, of all things, E. coli. Um, I, I'd also like to thank ASM for kind of helping me to um, sort of uh, stumble into uh, a new frontier of, of new media with this uh, podcast. And uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of uh, what it's like when, when I do it. Um, we use a Skype connection. Um, I'm generally uh, unshaven and disheveled, and my uh, room's a mess. But fortunately, we just do it with audio so that the people I interview can't actually see that. Um, I, I'm discovering that it's, it's an interesting challenge um, because uh, you know, when I'm interviewing someone, uh, it's not like writing a newspaper article or writing a book. So when I'm doing that, I could talk, sit down and talk to someone for a day or, or, or more, and then I could just extract some of the, 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 the most eloquent uh, little nuggets and, and put them in uh, a book or an article and then I'll sort of write around that.